It's my great honor to be invited to be a speaker at Virtual International Bangkok Symposium on HIV Medicine. I'm Dr. Tanyui Putanagit, Pediatrics Infectious Disease. I would like to give a talk on the title of Care for Kids Living with HIV. During the talk, I would like to address on the global update on 2020 target on pediatric HIV prevention and treatment. The second part on care for kids living with HIV, focusing on the new antiretroviral drugs, especially in the class of integrase tr transfer inhibitors, especially on dorotecovir. It is very exciting because we have drug and also formulations and also dosage for dorotecovir use in pediatrics. And second part on the op opportunistic infection, tuberculosis is the major opportunistic infection that causes morbidity and mortality. So uh, we would like to address on how to use tuberculosis prevention therapy in pediatric HIV. And the third one is on immunization. In general, immunization for pediatric HIV is quite similar to in general population, but I'd like to emphasize on the most important one is on HPV immunization, because HPV can cause morbidity and mortality, especially in pediatric HIV when the patients have severe immunosuppression. And on the last one is on integrated comprehensive care, especially on mental health screening and management for for families and also for children growing up with HIV. In terms of the updates of kids living with HIV, on the schema of UNAIDS on start free, stay free and AIDS free, with the target of ending AIDS by 2030, 2020 is the years with the major milestone. So let's see whether we can achieve the target. The first one is on start free. The parameter is number of children aged uh, birth from 14 years newly infected with HIV. The target is 40,000 kids, but so far the report up to 150,000 kids infected with HIV. For AIDS free, meaning that children living with HIV should be able to get antiretroviral treatment. The target is 1.4 million, but we have quite about a million kids living with HIV that receive treatment, which this number is much lower than adult living with HIV. So why that's occur? I think the most important one is on HIV testing, because in pediatrics, we are thinking about HIV when we know the, that the child was exposed to HIV from history from mother. So the major steps is to increase early infant diagnosis using HIV DNA PCR in some countries using at birth PCR to identify kids with high risk of HIV acquisition or in some countries using HIV DNA PCR at two months of age in order to cover most of the transmission both intrapartum and peripartum and also in settings with they use breastfeeding, have to do it again after cessation of breastfeeding, in which in the past few years, the increased uptake of early infant diagnosis is much better. However, in children who missed the, the opportunity to do early infant diagnosis and growing up with HIV, this one is very important because they can be slow progressor and will progress and manifest as AIDS symptom when they are in their uh, second decades of life. So how we can be able to detect this population? So the test itself, we can use HIV antibody, but the entry point or strategy to test is more important. So we include the index family-based testing, meaning that when it, we see the adult living with HIV, we need to go back and take history, whether they have kids or offspring, and test all children of adults living with HIV to be able to detect kids that might miss the cascade or early infant diagnosis. And also provider initiated testing and counseling in a settings that a child might present with opportunistic infection or AIDS symptoms, such as in a TB service or at nutrition ward. And one important thing is on the interpretation of HIV antibody. Among early treated infants that was identified from early infant diagnosis, when they received treatment very early, they are 
low HIV antibody positivity rate. It means that even though they are infected with HIV, confirmed PCR positive with early treatment, they might have HIV antibody test negative. For example, data from Thai infants who initiated ART with median age of only two months. After one year of treatment, only 26% of them had rapid anti-HIV positive. So this one is very important, not stop anti treatment. Because they received early infant diagnosis, receive early treatments that make them HIV antibody negative. In terms of treatment in pediatric populations, this data showing from high burden country in Africa but it's similar elsewhere that in general, the rate of HIV viral suppression in pediatrics population, which represented in green, is much lower than in adult population. It's only in a range of around 50 to 70 percent that have viral suppression. And why is that happen? It's because of the pediatric formulations and options of anti drugs is more limited in pediatrics. For children less than 20 kg, it's very limited ARV regimen that have approved or have appropriate dosage of formulation in pediatrics. And also, the pediatrics population rely on care providers for HIV treatment retention and also for adherence to daily ART regimen. And furthermore, we need to apply comprehensive care model to focus on specific groups such as kids with HIV advanced disease with disabilities or mental health issues. And in terms of mental health issues, it's not just only for a child, but we have to assess in a broader context of family assessment because they are the person who are the key to a child's health. And also when the child growing up, we also need to prepare them for transition to adolescent period, including HIV disclosure, and also involve them in HIV care. So in the next few slides, I would like to focus on anti drug for pediatrics. I combined data from PENTA guideline in 2019 and also updated DHHS guideline from US, which updated in December 2020. This BC table on the left hand side is on age categories and the first two blocks is on the third agent to combine with two NRTI backbone. So for kids less than two weeks, the regimen that is a, a, available is nevirapine oral solution and in DHHS guideline it just approved for rotigavir pediatric formulations for use for newborns above two kilograms. So in kids at birth to three, three years old, the re regimen is nevirapine or ropinavir. For PENTA guidelines, recommend dorotecavir. For US guidelines, recommend rotecavir, in which subsequently, I believe that it will be approved for dorotecavir. For age three years and above, we can use dorotecavir as a first line regimen. In the HSH guideline for kids Body weight less than 25 kg also recommend that boosted PI such as once daily atazinavir ritonavir, twice daily darunavir ritonavir, or rotecavir. For kids above 25 kg, can use the rotecavir or avitecavir cobicistat fixed dose combination. And for 12 years and above, can also use big tecavir, which all is integrase inhibitors class. For 2-NRTI backbone in pediatrics, we can use ACT3TC Syrup oral formulations or Abacavir3TC, which has disposable tablet for young kids. For older children, can start to use Tenofovir3TC for age 2 years and above, but there's still a concern on bone development. And for kids above 6 years old or body weight above 25 kilograms, TAF and FTC can be used. In kids, we have to also concern if they have co-infections such as hepatitis B, required TDF or TAF in NRTI backbone, or tuberculosis have to be careful if concomitant use with rifampin. So far, efarin is the preferred choice if used with rifampin. And if you use the rotecovy, it have to increase those to twice daily. And this is the slide that is very important of how to use the in pediatrics. 
data from ODC trial showing that if kids have body weight above 25 kg, which represented in blue color, can use the Rotecovia 50 mg film code tablet to have quite similar PK data comparing to adult using 50 mg vans daily. So this lead to approved dose of the Rotecovir adult tablet in kids above 20 kg. However, for kids body weight less than 20 kg, this data combined population pharmacokinetics from ODC trial and also P1093 using Dorotecovir is possible. And this one is nicely shown how to use as a body weight band Dorotecovir disposable tablet, which can be presented as a 5 mg disposable tablet or 10 mg score generic disposable tablet that can be used in young kids. And you can see that if we could like to use single tablet regimens of the Rotecovir, we have to concern about the dose of 2 in RTI. So even though the Rotecovir can use for 50 mg for a child body weight above 20 kg, but if we would like to use with TAF or Bacovir, have to be body weight above 25 kg. And if used with Chinofa, we have to have body weight above 25, 35 kg. And this one is also information from generic Dorotecovir disposable tablet, which is provided from the generic company, with a price is only about 120 US dollar per child, and it has approved from US FDA tentatively in November, and it will be available for lower price to most of the countries to provide DTG disposable tablet for pediatric formulations, which is very good news. In terms of adverse events, there are also data that they have increased risk of body weight gain. This data just published in Clinical Infectious Disease showing that in adolescent, after changing from majority from nevirapine to dorotecovir, female has significant increase of BMI change, in which this one is data from one year after change to dorotecovir, which we need um, more data of long term to see whether its effect on the BMI change in which data is quite similar to adult that female has significantly increased in BMI or body weight comparing to male. In terms of neurotube defect, the data showing that the risk of neurotube defect is 0.3% comparing to 0.1% if used other ART at conception. And this one, we need to emphasize that if you use derotecovir at a child who have reproductive capability, maybe need to combine folic acid to reduce risk of neurotube defect. In terms of other integrated strand transfer inhibitors for kids, Rotecovir has a strength that have many formulations, oral suspension, chewable tablet, and film code tablet. Elvitecovir and Bictecovir also have a strength that they have combination in a single tablet regimen. Elvitecovir is approved for child body weight above 25 kilograms. There are also ongoing study of uh, lower dose single tablet regimen which use 60% of dose that has data pub, uh, presented at international workshop for kids body weight 14 to 25 kilograms. Victecrovia is also approved for age about 6 to 12 years body weight more than 25 kilograms. However, there are some uh, limitations that they cannot use with rifampin. In terms of new antiretroviral drugs in development, in adult, there are many strategies such as two drug regimen, Dorotecovir plus Lamivudine or Dorotecovir plus Repirin, which approved for adults, but still in investigational or clinical trial in pediatrics population, or Doravirin, another NNRTI drugs, which have um, not quite overlap or cross resistant with efferins is approved in adult and in process of development in pediatrics. And for in other investigational drugs in adult in new classes, such as Islatrovir, Carbotrecovir, or Lecanaprovir, it's also progress in development in adult and hopefully will be more studies in pediatrics in years to come. In terms of tuberculosis prevention, Whenever patients come in, we need to screen for potential of TB disease, such as poor weight gain, fever, recurrent cough, or contact TB. However, in case without symptoms of tuberculosis, the BHO encouraged to provide more prevent 
infection for tuberculosis. In infant, 12, less than 12 months if contact with person with TB. But for children above 12 months, if living with settings with high TB transmission should provide TB prevention, in which there are more options in treatment regimen to use charter regimens such as isoniazid rifampin daily for three months or rifapentine isoniazid weekly for three months, in which this table showing the dose of rifapentine and isoniazid per body weight band. One of the issues that have concern is that even though even they have a risk of drug interactions with doritecovir, because we know that if we use doritecovir for treatment, we need to double dose into twice daily. However, if we use with prevention, data just released from adult data showing that doritecovir c trough will decrease for about 26% if used in combination of rifapentine isoniazid weekly. However, the dose is still enough. All have c trough above 300 nanogram per mil. So it's very likely that doritecovir can use in combination with rifampin isoniazid weekly TB prevention. However, for new drugs, if we will use in combination of rifampicin for treatment, Doritecovir have to be increased to twice daily. Bictecovir, the dose exposure is significantly dropped. TAF is also significantly declined for about 50%. So have to be uh, keep an eye on whether these drugs can be used with rifampin and whether we need to increase the dose. For immunization to children living with HIV, live vaccine is the one that have concern. However, majority can be given if CD4 above 15%. And measles, mumps, rubella, in the era of the resurgence of measles, should do revaccination after immune recovery for children experiencing severe immunosuppression. For human papilloma virus vaccine, many countries start to roll out in the national programs. However, for HIV infected children, we need to catch up or provide as much as possible for children living with HIV from age 9 to 26 years with three dose regimen in order to reduce risk of cancer in the future. In terms of mental health screening, it should be integrated in HIV service. Uh, this is just data showing that when we implemented mental health screening in our clinic in Thailand with PHQ-9, which is to screen for depression and GAT-7 screening for anxiety, we find that the prevalence of mental health disorder in adolescents living with HIV is around 13%. About 14% has suicidal ideation. Or in other words, one out of 10 adolescents living with HIV in the clinics has mental health problems. So we need to screen and then uh, manage properly. Data from resident study that we conducted in Thailand and Cambodia showing that 20% had depressive symptoms and about 25% experienced HIV-related inactive stigma. And they are also related. A child who have depression symptoms, it has increased risk if they have HIV-related stigma, have low household income, or have caregivers who have mental health problems. Therefore, mental health screening should be integrated in HIV service to screen for adolescents living with HIV and also for parents uh, in the clinics. This is the example of mental health screening tools that can be easily integrated in the clinics, such as to uh, take history, including HATES, which is home, education, eating, activities, drugs, sexuality, suicide, and safety in the clinics to triage and screen for uh, psychosocial issues, or PHQ-9, which is a night question to screen for depression. A suicidal rating scale, we can start um, asking simple questions. For example, have you wish you were dead or wish you could not, are you sleep and not wake up again? Do you have a thought of killing of yourself? Do you have a plan to do or you have ever attempt to do this? And this one, we, we be able to screen and then management in the clinics or have a linkage or referral or consultation service with the mental health people in which in the second days, we will have a lecture on mental health in care for people living with HIV. 
So at the end, I would like to conclude that care for kids living with HIV, we need to improve diagnosis because it's the first attempt that we can identify kids and then uh, start treatment. For care for kids living with HIV in this era, it will be via transition in first line and also second line. And also TB screening and prevention need to be integrated in the HIV service and also HPV immunization and also mental health screening in order to make sure that kids living with HIV will have proper care for HIV and also comorbidities. Thank you.